Okay, how's everyone doing? Still, okay. still awake? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. So my name is Nikita Maheshwari. Um, I'm a senior manager with Nutanix, and I'm actually based at our headquarters in San Jose, California. So I've had the privilege of being in the Netherlands for about a month, uh, getting to work out of our office in Hochdorf. Hof I, I, I can't pronounce that properly, but I've been uh, staying there for the month, and it's been a fantastic experience to actually be in EMEA and see see everything that's been going on around here. Um, so my goal today is actually to show you what's coming ahead for Nutanix, right? Um, a lot of the uh, focus today has been kind of what the core technology is and what hyperconvergence is doing. And my goal is to show you a bit of our roadmap, what's coming ahead, the vision ahead, so that uh, you as a community can continue to provide us feedback, continue to show, uh, get excited about what's coming because we've been learning a lot from all of you. Um, so before I begin, a quick question, um, is anyone in here has actually tried the Nutanix product? Okay, a good amount. And is anyone in here uh, a partner or a customer? You got a few? You can even come do the presentation then, yeah? <laughs> okay, so um, that's, that's good to know, that's good context for me. So for all of you that are new, um, just a quick background about us, right? So we are based in San Jose, California. Um, we were founded in 2009, and now we're at about uh, 1,100, 1,200 employees. The core product that we sell is a hyperconverged product, right? So this is this block that you see. We sell both hardware as well as software. It's an it's a appliance that we sell together. So we're not doing software only as some of the other vendors today we're talking about. And um, two, de two decisions the company made very early on was one, to go international. Um, hence, we have a very big presence internationally, right? One the, our second largest office is the one that I was speaking about. We have, uh, we're in over 70 countries. And the second decision was really to make our product focus across a lot of different industries. So our product is not really focused towards one vertical. We sell to retail, healthcare, um, uh, and really focusing on mid to large enterprises. That was really kind of the philosophy of the company and, and wh where we, we came to be. So very quickly, just to help understand a background for any of you that are new, right? We saw um, some of the vendors talking about this today. But as you look at the data center, one of the major disruptions happened when VMware came about. All of us, all of us are aware of this. And what were some of the changes that happened, right? First, servers became a lot more efficient. Um, we had a lot more VMs. We went from having one application on one silo to now having hundreds of applications running on, running on this platform. The second was that really the storage didn't change, right? So we were using the same kind of centralized storage um, despite the fact that compute had increased uh, and the utilization on compute had increased so immensely. Um, but an interesting phenomenon was hap happening, right? One, um, there were more VMs per server, but actually more servers started to come about as well, the reason being apps became so easy to actually start deploying, right? So you're seeing an increase in the number of servers, you're seeing an increase in the number of the utilization of the servers, but you're really seeing no change in the storage, right? The two storage controllers that were dealing with the system before is now dealing with the same system where there's so many more applications, so many more servers uh, taking it. There's a big hit on these two controllers. Um, there's a lot more random read and writes that are happening. Um, there's a, 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 an effort to actually fix this, right? So Flash comes about. And the idea is, OK, can Flash actually solve some of these problems that we're facing in the data center? Um, but really, Flash was uh, something that was brought on after the storage controllers, right? So it's not really solving the problem that the two storage controllers were, were having. So if we had to reconstruct the way the data center was done, how would we recreate this? How would we actually make storage um, available for the current system of virtualization? So we weren't novel in doing this, right? Because there's a lot of companies that had been tackling this years before Nutanix did. You look at what Google and Facebook had done, they've been doing this for years, um, Amazon as well, right? Their data centers are extremely efficient. They have, uh, everything is software based. They're highly distributed systems and they have a massive uh, ability to scale. But these principles, um, these data centers were designed for these applications. They're designed for also all of us can upload a thousand fa uh, Facebook photos, right? They're designed so that you can have Google Maps um, running on, the, on these systems. So this was the architecture and what Google and Facebook did was design them really for the uh, large scale applications. So Nutanix, what we decided to do is um, 
how can we make this architecture relevant for the enterprise, right? How can uh, you, not having a thousand PhDs to build this architecture, have this enterprise uh, data center and have this kind of magic and this kind of scalable data center uh, without the need to be a Google or Facebook? And what we made is this, is, this is our core architecture, right? And what you see here is essentially we have uh, different nodes. And um, on each of these nodes, this is a standard x86 servers that we have running. Um, on this, we have SSD and HTD. So every single server has SSD and HTD attached to it. We actually support three hypervisors, so we don't just support ESXi and uh, Acropolis, which is uh, uh, two that were mentioned earlier. We also support Hyper-V. Um, and Acropolis hypervisor is our own hypervisor that we introduced earlier this year. It's essentially KVM that we took and added customization to it, added a lot more security and management to it. So those are the three hypervisors we support. And you essentially run the VMs that you want on top of those hypervisors, um, similar, to you, you, similar to how you would do it today. The difference is all of our IP is in the controller virtual machine. So you have a controller virtual machine on top of the x86. And this controller virtual machine essentially acts as your new controller. So in a system where you traditionally had two storage controllers, you now have a controller virtual machine for every single server that you're adding on, right? So every time that you add on a new server, first, you're adding on new compute power. Second, you're adding new storage. And then third, most importantly, you're actually adding controller logic. That's what really leads to the scale out uh, design that we, that we have. Um, a few points to mention about this architecture, right? So uh, it actually has a lot of the benefits of centralized storage as well, because what it lets you do is actually pool storage together. So for node one through three, let's say you wanted to create one cluster and have all of that act as a virtual storage pool, the system lets you do that. That would be one cluster. Let's say you want to take the next set of uh, nodes and actually make a pooled cluster, you could do that as well. So you can continue to make pooled storage, um, but every node actually has its own SSD HTD. This, all, this CVM includes all of intelligent tiering, dedupe, snapshots, et cetera, right? All the key functionalities required for enterprise grade storage system. Um, so this architecture, what does it work well for? Uh, one, it works well for a lot of different kinds of workloads. Two, um, what we actually find with our customers is this, this targets, we target mid to large deployments. So um, in the United States, we have Best Buy, they're a big retailer. They have completely standardized their data center on Nutanix, right? We have, um, in Netherlands, uh, we have a, a company, uh, Siligro, and they actually have a 50 to 60 no, node deployment on Nutanix. The federal United States government is running uh, thousands of VDI desktops on Nutanix. So we target large, uh, mid to large enterprises. And the reason is because we find that the power of this architecture actually grows as you grow your deployment. Um, all, of it, all of our functionalities are distributed. So when you do dedupe, when you do compression, these are actually distributed and the power of these increase as you add on more nodes, right? Um, the second is the cost advantage really increases increases as you add on more nodes as well. Management is quite simple, right? Every, every hyper-converged vendor will tell you this. Management is simple, management is simple. What are some examples of that? You click one button, and you can do a storage upgrade for the whole cluster. Obviously, if your cluster is bigger, right, you're saving more time as you do storage upgrades compared to a traditional three-tier solution. Um, you add on, as, as you're adding on a node. Um, earlier, uh, you talked about the idea of uh, time to value right, with the hyper-converged vendors. Well, this increases every time you're adding on a node. You lower prediction risk, right? You don't need to you overutilize and, and decide that, hey, two years from now, I'm going to actually need this many terabytes of data or this many petabytes of data. These are all some of the advantages that you get with an architecture where you can scale, start small, and then scale over time. So that was really what we call hyperconverged stage one. This is what Nutanix has been doing till now. What we unveiled earlier this year and what's on our roadmap is the next state of hyperconverge, and that includes two pieces, right? The first is our Prism uh, UI. So this is our user interface. And what we're doing in here that I'd say is different from other folks is bringing a lot more analytics and operational insight. And I'll show you examples of that, because that's the easiest way to actually see this come to life. And the second piece of this is the app mobility fabric. Uh, this is the idea that we believe that you should have the ability to uh, decouple VMs from your uh, infrastructure, right? So, as you think about the future, you think about which VMs you want to host on premise, which VMs you actually want to host in the cloud. You should have a very simple way of doing that. And this is how we are enabling that through our app mobility fabric. 
So let's start with um, storage, right? So our long-term vision is our focus for the company right now has really been on storage. As we look forward, it's going to be about virtualization and then cloud, right? Those are the three pieces our company wants to focus on in making all of these very seamless for you as an admin to act upon. For storage, um, this is what we call our distributed storage fabric. We're really looking at the roadmap in a few different ways. We're looking at how can we actually give you functionalities that help you optimize your applications. So one of the things that we're doing is we're going to be enabling you to actually uh, pin VMs to Flash, right? So let's say you have an Oracle VM. Um, you don't automatically want the data to be tiered from um, HTD to SSD. You can actually pin this Oracle VM to Flash to ensure that you're always going to be getting the high performance, right? The second is the way that we're actually thinking thinking about packaging our solution, right? So one thing that we are enabling you to do is actually configure to order. So you can actually put in exactly how much memory you want, how much HDD you want, how much SSD you want, and configure to order. For a customer, what this means, and for a company, what it means is um, allowing you the flexibility to have a lot more workloads, right? So uh, in the early days of Nutanix, VDI was a big workload for us. Now, because our platforms have increased, we have customers using us for SAP, Oracle, Exchange, SQL, et cetera. So um, this model lets you be more flexible. And the last that I want to get does into. That does that extend to, al to allowing me to buy compute without storage? Not, no. Well, what, right now, we in the roadmap, we do have a storage only node coming, uh, but no, we're not. No, that's not something we have available right now. And that's, that, I mean, for high, as a hyperconverged vendor, that's something that is part of our philosophy, right? Is uh, to, to let you do the, the, let you actually scale the two together. One of the key things is erasure coding that I want to speak about today. Um, we've had some uh, folks talk about erasure coding and what it really means for their systems, right? So the way that um, Nutanix currently handles resiliency is we have this idea of a resiliency factor of two or resiliency factor of three. So essentially, when a copy of data comes in, um, a, a copy of that is made and until any system operation can be done on that, right? This ensures that you always have two copies of the data. We actually extend this a bit further, and we let you actually do something um, called re resiliency three. So for a mission critical application, you could actually have three copies of the data if you choose to do so. The great thing about this uh, method is, one, um, it lets you do rebuilds very quickly, but obviously it takes a toll on the storage system, right? So if you have 100 terabytes, it's going to be going down to 50 terabytes, right? So that is a, that is a clear toll that we were aware about. So what we decided to do, it looks like the clicker's not working, so I'll go here, is we thought, how can we actually take the new way that, or you can see my screen in lime green. Okay. So um, what we decided to do is actually implement erasure coding um, in a different form so that our system could utilize the benefits of erasure coding, but also not get some of the major compute uh, d d disturbances that you have, right? So um, erasure coding, for any of you that know, uh, it's, it's actually, to some extent, um, a form of RAID. But what RAID does, it's really bottlenecked by one disk, right? It's bottlenecked by symbols, a single disk. What we're doing in erasure coding is we're calculating parity, but we're using the whole system. We're, we're doing the rebuild across all the nodes. So it's really a lot more distributed in nature and gives you a lot more benefits of, hey, you know, I, my rebuilds are not going to be bottlenecked, and um, I can actually have uh, less compute intensive performance when I'm, when I'm dealing with this. So let's talk about how this works, right? Um, so what we do is we encode a strip of data blocks. And uh, what we actually do is this calculates parity. And this is, this is done on cold data. Um, in the event of a host or disk failure, the parity can be leveraged to calculate the missing data blocks. So if you thought about, um, you know, think about it as a, kind of like two puzzle pieces, if you actually know what the, the missing one is, you could pot potentially put the puzzle together because you know what the missing one looks like, right? That's kind of the, the idea behind erasure coding. And this is a post-process framework. So we actually uh, do not affect the I.O. path at all when we're doing this. The way that Nutanix that's doing this, why this is different, we've actually had this technology being built for two years. And um, what's making our technology different is first, this is a completely a software based 
base implementation, right? So we have no hardware dependencies. Um, our customers actually just did an upgrade. Uh, this was available in a last software upgrade. So you could actually just get the so software upgrade and start using Erasure coding. So it has no dependency on the hardware. That's one. Um, the second is that we've actually developed our own algorithm for this, so we're not uh, using the traditional st industry standard. So because of this algorithm, we actually have less computational impact than, um, than a lot of other, uh, other implementations of Erasure coding. And the third piece of this um, is this that we are actually also talking about uh, data locality. So at a given time when rebuilds are being done, like I mentioned, the, compute, the complete cluster is being used for uh, uh, rebuild, right? So we are, one, maintaining data locality, and two, the rebuilds are a lot quicker because of the way that we've implemented this. So this is a technology we are very excited about. Uh, if any of you have our software, you can actually uh, implement it and try it out for yourself and provide us feedback. So in terms of some of the kind of results, what I mentioned earlier was with the resiliency factor of two, you had 100 terabytes that was going to about 50 terabytes, right? With erasure coding, you could potentially get this up to about 75 terabytes. So uh, we, we understood some of the pitfalls of the resiliency method, but we wanted to definitely keep the quick time and keep the type of resiliency that we were getting with RF2 and RF3, and we brought in erasure coding to do this. Okay, so um, this is my favorite part of the presentation. So um, app mobility fabric. Has, have any of you seen a demo of this by any chance? All right, so as I spoke about, a big part of our future and why we think uh, this is not where hyperconvergence ends, right? It doesn't end at storage. It's really the ability for you to take your VMs and completely separate them from the infrastructure, right? So imagine a scenario, uh, you, you, Nigel was just talking about the idea that you have to try something in the cloud, right? You want to run some VMs in the cloud. What if you had the ability to very quickly just take two VMs and quickly put them in the cloud? Test if this would actually work for you, right? So what we're doing with the app mobility fabric is letting you decouple and actually try VMs you want on different hypervisors. And the larger vision being you could actually take a VM or take a host and actually put it on the cloud that you chose to do so to AWS, Azure, et cetera. So um, what would be a use case for this? Let's say you're running a production environment on ESXi, and you're running a dev test uh, environment on a propolis hypervisor. And as you're changing your ways, or the way the development cycle is changing, you actually want to switch the two. You could do that with the app mobility fabric, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you a quick video of how this is done. Um, for the sake of time today, I've made some short videos, but we have demos running of some of the functionalities that I'm showing you today at, at our table. All right, so what you're seeing here is you're seeing different hosts, and all these hosts actually are uh, <coughs> running on different hypervisors, right? So what you have here is you have some running on ESXi, you have some running on Acropolis hypervisor, some running on uh, Hyper-V. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, if I want to transfer a host over, let's pick one host, and I want to actually convert this host, right? So you just pick an action, and it says convert. And you essentially can take your target hypervisor and go from Acropolis to Microsoft Hyper-V. In this case, we're, these are the two we're allowing for right now. Uh, let's say you want to take this and convert it to Acropolis Hypervisor. You click OK, and the initiation is done. Right, So it's a one-click uh, conversion process. Once you click on the blue dot, it's actually letting you know exactly what's happening, right? So what's happening is, one, the system is starting node conversion. So it's getting ready to actually convert to Acropolis Hypervisor. The Acropolis Hypervisor image is getting converted. Um, the image will get transferred over. Then all the user VMs will be getting ready to actually get uh, transferred over. Then the system will be rebooting. And then that's pretty much it, right? So what we have done is we have enabled you to have a one-click conversion from the Acropolis hypervisor to uh, Microsoft Hyper-V, et cetera. Right? The idea is take uh, this trend of multi-hypervisors, take this world where you might not no longer be on ESXi or you might not be on Hyper-V tomorrow, and give you the utmost flexibility to actually change, change between hypervisors. Does that make sense? OK, so extending this further, uh, what the next vision that we have is why does this have to actually stop at the hypervisor, right? 
Imagine a scenario most companies are thinking about a hybrid cloud strategy. Two weeks ago, I was at VMworld uh, San Francisco. This was the hottest topic there. How is your company prepared for hybrid cloud, right? Um, what if you had the ability to actually change not just the hypervisor, but actually decide if you wanted to put certain VMs on AWS? So what we have here is a quick demo. So what I have here is a bunch of different VMs that are running. And what you'll see is it's currently running on ESXi. And what we'll now do is actually go and uh, go ahead and if you want to, uh, migrate this VM over to an Amazon, right? Amazon AWS. Here right now we have Azure and we have Amazon Web Services. So we click Submit. And what it's doing is it's creating a snapshot, it's replicating the data, it's basically creating the proper EC2 and EBS volume, and that's it. And the way this works is Nutanix actually puts essentially a controller VM in AWS. This is longer down our vision, right? This is not exact, we're, we're, we're working towards this, but um, we're slowly getting there. So right now with the uh, Nutanix product, you can already do backup to AWS. The next vision is to, hey, let you do DR, and finally the goal is, hey, could you actually go ahead and migrate a whole VM over to AWS? if you choose to. Okay, got it. So when we talk about app mobility fabric, that's really where we're heading. It's all these different trends that are letting you have utmost flexibility of your VMs and your hosts between hypervisors as well as uh, clouds. The second piece I want to talk about is Prism. So this is, um, I mentioned Prism is our user interface, right? Have any of you played around with Prism? Yeah? Did you, did you like the, the experience? Was it easy for you? Even I understand. Even you understood it, okay. That's a good sign, yeah. So um, the idea was we hired a consumer grade designer into Nutanix and said, hey, totally revamp the enterprise experience. So we've gotten a good feedback on Prism. It's been, uh, it's basically lets you do a lot of the key functionalities. But we said if we had to generate the next types of insights, what would they be, right? So if you as an admin actually got VM level views, if you got app level views, what would be, they be to make your data center more efficient? So let me show you an example. Okay, so yes, we have monkeys as you guys can see. That is the new, that's the only update we made to this uh, Prism UI. So um, what we've allowed customers to do now is actually customize their dashboards. So one feedback we got is, hey, uh, you know, I have certain views I wanna see, certain views I don't wanna see. And here you can see a lot of different things. You could see things by performance, by uh, cluster storage, et cetera. The new functionality is really the search ability, right? So like Google, could you actually go ahead and search? Let me pause this for a second so I can speak. So what this is letting you do is let me put in a VM and let me see what kind of search results I get. And this search is being conducted across multiple things. So it's being conducted across our, the key actions, key alerts, as well as knowledge base uh, items, right? So can you do search across a whole system to see the kinds of uh, uh, insights you need? So here we search for VM and you'll see a whole set of tasks come up. We're looking at knowledge base, we're looking at um, some of the actions. Now let's say we want to search for an app, right? So Oracle here is coming up and what this is actually doing is it's consolidating all the Oracle VMs and letting you show it. So it has three Oracle VMs and we're going to click in and view the details. Here we see things like latency, we're seeing bandwidth, we're seeing IOPS, right? Um, we see that there's a spike in the IO latency and you can actually drill down. So you drill down in this IO latency and see what's actually going on here. You dig in and you see that there's actually a red alert, right? This is, there was an event that occurred that read, led to this kind of latency. And you actually dig deep into this and there'll be an event that comes up that's basically showing there was an issue with the controller VM. So the idea is how proactive can we make this so that you know exactly what's going on in your system so that you know that you know, there is nothing, um, what happened in the past, could that happen in the future, as well as is there anything proactive we can actually be telling you so you have more uh, forward looking into what your data center is, what the operations are going. The second piece of this, this that um, I'm excited about is really the idea of uh, viewing your VMs in different functions and giving you a lot more specific feedback, right? Okay, almost done, a minute. So in this case, what we have is our prism, which is a, a, a different view. This is called entity view. So you can actually see it by clusters, VMs, hosts, um, and you'll have all of those services actually come up on the VM, right? So let's say you view VMs here, 
And what you can actually do is group your VMs by different functionalities if you choose. So in this case, we'll do uh, a group, and you can actually see, you know, uh, see which ones are powered on or powered off. In this case, we have a whole set of VMs. And what we're going to actually do here is we're going to uh, choose to select a VM and then actually uh, clone this VM. So here you'll see that there's a bunch of VMs. And some of these, the red is indicating they're off, there's indicating there's on. So first what we're doing is we're creating a VM. And all you do is just put a name of the VM, how much memory you want to give it, how much compute you want to give it, and the VM will be created. So this one's called the next, next demo. Um, it's uh, automatically going to allocate the disk once you decide where you want to put it. So we're saying, hey, keep it on the same container. And we've given the VM a size of two gigabytes. We can add networking here as well. So once we do this, um, this VM will get created. It'll be these, these savings, the, these uh, features will be saved. And what we can actually do now is if we choose to, we could uh, do different kinds of actions on these VMs, right? So if you want to, you could uh, migrate VMs. If you want to, you could actually clone the VMs. In this case, what we're actually going to do is we're going to go ahead and select the VM, and then we're going to go ahead and clone it. So there's a lot of functions, convert, power on, power off, et cetera, create a snapshot. We're giving it the same name, and then we're going to make uh, 100 copies of this. So as you create this, um, all the settings are the same. You'll see it actually uh, saved that and realized that. Um, what's going to naturally happen is we have a lot of storage going into the system, right? There is essentially uh, now there's a lot more. There's 100 VMs created. They all have two gigabytes of storage. and the system, this is the system right now, they're getting the power state is off, they've been created, and then it's essentially going to start coming on. These are the 101 VMs. So what the system is going to tell us is, hey, you're going to be running out of storage capacity. Um, these are a lot of VMs here that you just got going, right? So let's say we turn them all on. So these are the 101 VMs. If you turn them all on, click OK, yep. And now they'll slowly start turning on. You can see these come up, right? So what we see is, OK, these VMs are starting to come on. What's, what's happening with the system? And what we'll notice is there's actually an alert that's come up at the top, right? So this is how Prism does alerting. So there's this idea that you know, when key things are coming, you'll actually get these notifications at the top of Prism to let you know, hey, what's working well, what's not working well. So in this case, it tells you, hey, disk capacity is running out, right? So in this, here, what you can see is a deep dive view of the disk capacity. And you can see, hey, what's the runway? What's the kind of analytics that I can get to it? Can I do a deep dive into the colors to see, to see what's going on? So here, when you look in, you'll actually see there's 28 days left of uh, runway capacity. Right? You just made 100 VMs. There's only 28 days left. So let me pause this, because this is um, one of my favorite pieces of it. So this is giving you two recommendations now. It's saying, hey, you can add new nodes to this, or you could actually remove dead VMs. Right? So the system is telling you exactly what you could do to make this problem go away. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, let's add a node. Um, it's one of the simplest things to do. It's actually recommending what node to add. So in this case, it's uh, recommending one of our storage heavy nodes. It adds the nodes. And what we'll see is the whole system reconfigures. It auto-detects. Auto one of the things our system does is very quickly when you plug a node in, it auto-detects the node. The node has been uh, detected. We will click Save, and the whole system has been set up. Right. So essentially, the proactive analytics the proactive analytics is letting you actually see runway ahead. It's letting you prepare for the future. And a key part of this is, hey, you shouldn't have to buy over buy today. The system will start telling you when you need it, when you can buy it. Right. And now we have 358 days, so we have another year until we have to worry about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two features I wanted to show you. We have demos of a lot of this. Um, I'm completely out of time, but that's really the future as we see it, right? It's about analytics. It's about co continually optimizing our storage. And finally, it's about giving you the ability to have complete flexibility for your VMs as you think about multi-hypervisors and the cloud. Um, the last thing I want to see, uh, have any of you tried Community Edition, which is our free software version? OK, so we have our uh, free software version available. You can try a lot of these functionalities, and you can try our Acropolis hypervisor. Just go to Nutanix.com slash CE. It's a software that you can just download on the, your home lab. Okay, And we have a booth. We have demos, and we'll show you them live. I know we're out of time. But thank you very much. Thank you.